Hey there fellow downtimers, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis, and during this extended downtime activity, let's reread the player's handbook and discuss skills and ability checks today on WebDM. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Fog, the online map maker and authoring tool for game masters. With this award-winning tool, you can save yourself hours of time and generate gorgeous maps of buildings, rooms, dungeons, and more. And just this week, they've rolled out templates. Now you can define maps as templates and use them as a base instead of drawing everything from scratch. The new system is available to all users and comes with a workover of the new map overlay. You can now add templates, edit template categories, and save time for last minute battle maps. In addition to their free version and regular subscription, Dungeon Fog offers on demand. Check it out, link in the comments and description. Okay, Jim, hmm. let's uh, let's talk about skills uh, to pay the bills. Oh yes, uh, yes. I mean, you can use your skills to pay the bills. <laughs> if you're taking uh, the right downtime activity, you certainly can. Right, uh, <laughs> which we'll get to later. We put out the call to, to the peoples, right? Oh, yes, yeah. And uh, they responded. There were a lot of questions about skills. Certainly, So yes. you were like, hey, we should do a whole series on it. So that's what we're going to do, right? <laughs> yeah, 5th edition's getting long in the tooth. You know, it's been around for a while. I know that there's a lot of little, talk. A little gray in the beard? Yeah, just a little bit. I still see, you know, both from uh, people that ask us direct questions, going online, looking for stuff. A lot of confusion around skills and how they're supposed to be used and, like, who initiates a skill role. Like, yeah, what are, are they skills supposed to be used? At all. Like, technically, there's not skills. You don't ever roll for a skill. You roll an ability check that uh, your skill proficiency uh, might apply, you know, it's modifier to. And so I find, like, you know, there's a lot of language from prior editions that get mixed up with it that only mm -hmm. further confuses the issue. <laughs> and so yeah. uh, when we get questions about, like, say, skill dogpiling or players either not interacting with the world, thinking that they can only interact with the world through their skills, or, like, being too proactive and, like, rolling before there is a chance to even establish what the DC is. Yeah, the DM yeah. says you walk into a room. I roll a perception check. It's like, well, hang on now. Hang on now. <laughs> Hold Just... your horses. <laughs> yeah. If you go and look in the rule books, which we're about to, it's sort of understandable. The DM, uh, the DMG and the player's handbook have uh, you know, some pretty robust sections on using ability scores and, uh, and, and checks. But it's also, there's a lot of holes there. And mm -hmm. where a lot of people see that as the f a fault of the system, I see it more as like an opportunity for you to make it exactly what you want. So they've yeah. given us this basic building block, right? They've told us like, this can be used to craft anything you want out of the system. There's attack rolls, there's saving throws, there's ability checks. And ability checks is like literally 98% of the, <laughs> you know, the rest of the things you might do. Yes, I know d and is about combat, all that other kind of stuff. Um, but that is uh, your decision. Your games don't have to be that way. Really, ability scores are probably used to resolve actions more than just about anything, right? Yeah, talking to people, sneaking around people, trying to find people, trying to find things. And I do love, like, the point you were making earlier, how, like, you're not making a skill roll, you're, you're making an ability roll, ability uh check mm -hmm. but you have a you could have a skill proficiency right like and i like how a lot of other games they call it they usually call it a focus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you can do this general thing but you're really good at a specific really part of specific this thing, yeah. thing right yeah. and so there, there's a little confusion on that but you know I, thinking of the the skill proficiencies as more of like focuses or foci i actually like that it actually made more sense to me yeah uh, yeah thinking about it that way and it's exactly what the player's handbook says, right? Yeah. So this is one of those things where when I started really diving deep into this and like considering all the questions that we got and, and just my own questions about it, it was like a lot of this is answered just in the text of the rules. And so in the player's handbook, it says that an ability represents more than just your innate talent, but it also represents training that you've had. And mm -hmm. that training might correspond with these specialized areas, but it might not. And if it does correspond to these specialized areas, which you would have a skill proficiency in, then you get to roll that. Uh, and the, sometimes there are situations where you can like switch things up and have a different proficiency with a different score. But for the most part, they correspond with you know their set scores that everybody's kind of familiar with. Right there from the beginning, one of the things that I, had always bothered me about fifth edition was like the importance of ability scores. It was just sort of one of those things where I was like, Oh, that kind of clears things up. They do they do consider that partial training. It's not just innate. It, it's sort of a combination of both. And yes. all right, my, my perspective is freshened. I, I could sort of see skills as being more of a focus area, in which case 
skill proficiency is kind of a it doesn't accurately describe what's going on here uh not really i don't know i th- i think it's a it's a solid like i said i it, most other systems have some version of this whether or not you you like how they kind of collapse skills down into you know like three or four or two oh, yeah. to two to four skills into one yeah. uh like they did in fifth edition i don't know i don't mind that at all whether it's sight or or you know spot or listen it's sure, just a different sure. version of, of sensing something i think that there's merit for like breaking down the skills into their more specialized components and Mm -hmm. we are we're going to have a show in this series where we're talking all about modifications and hacks and things like that so we will dig into that deeper uh further Mm -hmm. in the series but this is more of a introductory kind of thing for the purposes of fifth edition which deals in broad strokes archetypes feels right does something feel right that the broad categories of skills uh work and you should embrace their expansiveness uh, and not be limited in terms of what they can and can't do. One of the mm-hmm. things that um, I went sort of looking for was addressing an issue that we get a lot of questions about where it's like either my players don't, uh, either they don't wait until I have asked, you know, the DM has asked for a role uh, oh, yeah. and they then they have to deal with like a cascade <laughs> of different die rolls and, and therefore they can't feel, they feel like they can't have like, meaningful failure in that situation they don't have time to think about it and i was like all right what's going on here and apart from like just the way the game's played and how people you know i don't know there's a difference between raw and how the game's actually played right um but yeah in terms of the rules it's sort of clear that the dungeon master calls for uh an ability check anytime that the outcome is uncertain or there is a uh, a chance for failure and that's in the player's handbook. And then if you hop over to the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, on page 237, it's got one that says, uh, the Dungeon Master should only call for a roll if there is a meaningful consequence of failure. This is one of those things that I think gets forgotten a lot of times when it comes to ability checks, uh, whether skilled or not, is that like, if there's not something that's gonna change the state of the game, Right. If there's not something that's going to introduce a new wrinkle or complicate matters or or somehow drive conflict in a different direction, then like what's really at stake? Is it even worth rolling? You know, mm-hmm. why not just let them succeed if it's plausible and then narrate it and move on? That's something that I've really been like sitting with uh, for a while because it's like when how you make that decision of whether something's worth rolling for or not, you know, how you determine what it, what it means to have meaningful failure. That's a big thing. It's kind of like they skip kind of over it. <laughs> There's not well, a lot yeah. in the rule books to guide you here, but it's a big step. It comes with passive, like, perception and passive investigation, mm-hmm. but you don't want to tip your hand. Sure. And that's why I think they tried to introduce those concepts yeah. in order to not tip your hand. Oh, yes. Uh, as to, you know, something in the room that is there to be perceived and found. Yeah. To stick with what what you were talking about before, though, with regards to skill uh, dogpiling yeah, and like yeah, yeah. getting that cascade. So say you're a dungeon master who has taken right. control of your table, right? Sure. And is like, all right, I don't need a perception check. But before they can finish the sentence, they people still like just start throwing them at it. Like, right. how would you handle that? Would you would you would you make it a group check if if everybody wanted to participate, or would you just do the rapid fire every all five people get a separate check? Uh, in those situations, if it's appropriate, I will turn that into a group check. But usually only after a, you know, like a, a confirmation that everyone is participating in a group event. A lot of times that's enough to make people go, oh, yeah, no, I'm not anywhere near that. I, I, I just reflexively, you know, rolling perception. Yeah, yeah? We're, right? Yeah, yeah got it. <laughs> we got this, guys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, their character was actually somewhere else, in which case, uh, you know, you, you can safely ignore the ones that aren't participating but if it's something that only one character would be interacting with i just ignore the roles i just and i'll tell them like the guys you can do that all you want but this is what we're doing here for this one character if you would like to participate that's another matter but if it's already mm-hmm. rolled like it's not you're not gonna get retroactive help one of the skills of being a player is paying attention to moments that your characters can help and I know that they can uh, pass by pretty quickly in the moment of exploration play or something happening in a social interaction. It's also sort of an incentive to stay with the game and stay engaged mm-hmm. so that you can see like, oh yeah, my character can totally help here. Maybe they could even use a different kind of proficiency because of X, Y, Z related to the situation at hand. I don't know. I've, I've, I'm on a, I went on a tangent. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know oh, where no, I'm no, at, no. Pruitt. I, Bring no, me no, back. I, I love it. I love it. Hey, it's, I, I have expertise in this. To get back to um, 
like when it's when it's necessary to call for it. Right. Yeah. Uh, moving kind of in. Uh, would you like to talk about passive? I, we're going to have to because passive is one of three ways that you can right. automatically succeed on a check. <laughs> exactly. So it's kind of moving into that where, like you said, the, the, the DM is calling for roles or when they when do they need to. Right. So in those situations, using passive perception and investigation, mm-hmm. um, like when is it appropriate to use that versus call for a check? Because sure, a lot sure. of players, you know, you go into a, a musty old room and you call for a perception check. They're immediately thinking, is it treasure? Oh, yeah. Is oh, it yeah. a trap? Is it a monster in the corner? You know, right. versus, you know, you don't let them know unless you let them know because, hey, your passive perception, you notice oh, something yeah. move. Oh, yeah. I love passive perception. I absolutely love it. And on a lot of cases, I, it's what I use three quarters of the time when I need to know what the players perceive uh, mm-hmm. or what their characters perceive. And unless they actively tell me, like, oh, I'm keeping a lookout here. I'm, I'm actively keeping watch over this area or something, in which case their passive perception acts as a floor. I, I, I do agree with that one uh, interpretation of it by Crawford where it's like, yeah, your, your perception, passive perception is sort of the floor because anything below that, the failure of it is incongruent with the character you've made. Right, like to me, that's you, sort you of how. You don't think people I, gonna have an off day? I mean, they can have an off day. That's what disadvantage is for. Um, yeah. <laughs> that is that is what the DM gets to rule on. Of like, n- no, you pass a perception. I don't care what it is. There's no way you could perceive this creature, or this mm-hmm. object, or whatever it is. So it's still in the DM's hands whether the passive perception comes into play at all. And I love just the idea of passive scores. You know, is are the players trying to like sneak through enemy territory over the course of a long period of time? You guys better roll passive stealth, or not tell, roll passive stealth, but tell me what each of your individual passive stealths are, because this is something you're trying to do all day. And it's not just deck stealth, it's going to be constitution stealth. You know, this is an endurance uh, match, something yeah. like that. Yeah, how, can, how long can you walk, crouch down so you're below the right. bush level in the woods? Right. You know, because you're all a bunch of six foot tall badasses uh, right. with yeah, three with... foot tall bushes, so you're just, okay. Exactly. My back. With your glowing <laughs> magical armor, yeah, um, yeah. So things like that are, are how I would use it. But the three that I find I use the most are passive perception, passive insight, and passive investigation. And passive investigation is largely there for illusions, uh, things mm-hmm. like that, things that you know you would just notice by fine detail. Um, but also things like secret doors, because I'm a fan of the kind of D and D where an elf can walk by a secret door and just be like, "Yep, there it is." You know, they don't really have to actively check if they don't want to and passive insight just because i get tired of players asking for insight checks on npcs instead just sort of what's your passive what's your passive insight i will roll against it and let you and then we can role play that out in a more naturalistic manner yeah Uh, (laughs) to me that that is uh whereas for exploration it's the it's the perception check just called for at a moment's notice social encounters Uh somebody's like hey welcome to this bar insight check check. insight (laughs) it's like he just he wants to sell you a beer, like, and, and give you some some clues. <laughs> what kind of world do you live in? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I get you that. You can't trust your bartender. Come yeah, because if you want to me, if you want an active insight check, that means you you're not a viable participant in this conversation. You know, like if what you're trying to do is actively look and 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 focus in on someone to the point where they might be off put by that, they might not like that you might not be able to fully participate in a conversation with them because you're too focused on what they're doing paradoxically right right? all right the person with persuasion and a decent enough insight does the talking and then someone who's maxed out expertise inside is doing the observing those are situations that you can kind of mix things up in the in the ever present and and uh typical uh, interrogation that happens at low level <laughs> yeah of every single npc where you have uh the person uh behind their their polygraph screen yeah checking because of course insight is a polygraph and your cleric forgot zone of truth so yeah <laughs> <laughs> to stick with like auto successes because this is something that the dm might want to figure out if if their uh you know even attempt this check is needed because it's automatically successful you can take the the route of it just takes 10 times longer uh, and the DMG recommends this for something that uh, is failed on the first attempt, but could reasonably uh, succeed over a long period of time. The old taking mm-hmm. 10, taking 20 from third edition. It's sort of like, in this case, it takes 10, but then it also is like, 
it tells you nothing about how long these skills take to use and what time intervals you're working with. And so while that's something that you can intuit in the moment and go like, oh, you're trying to pick a log that, that takes a little time, a couple minutes at least, if, if not like a round for fast hands or magic or something. Um, the others might not be like, how long does a survival check take when you're trying to track someone over the course of a day? You know what yeah. I mean? Like it, it, things that take extended periods of time. At what point in that process is the check made? One of the things that we do know about failure in fifth edition is from the uh, player's handbook, which says failure either is no progress towards your goal or progress, uh, little progress made with a setback. The DMG doesn't offer a lot in terms of like what to do with that or how to make that interesting. It offers some suggestions for success at a cost or degrees of failure. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, a lot of this is up for interpretation. And so DMs might not want to subject, say, a character that has, you know, a certain specialty in, like, say, athletics or stealth or something. They don't want to have to deal with the incongruence of a failed stealth role by the rogue uh, any more than the player does. It's not something that the rogue is supposed to be bad at. Hey, but you can a always kick that metal can uh, when you don't really uh, any more than the player. Or step uh, on the branch in the woods. You could, and that's why we're rolling D20s. You mm -hmm. know, the, the swinginess of the D20 in this sense is a, a feature, but it also creates weird moments, uh, especially if you use the variant uh, that they caution uh, maybe not to use, the variant of using critical failures and critical successes. Well, that was going to be my next question, Jim. When you're talking about auto failure or auto success, do you do that at your, uh, at your table? No, I, I don't like it uh, for that. I, I'd use degrees of failure instead of uh, ones and twenties, um, with the margin being ten instead of five. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like. There are some things where a five percent chance of catastrophic failure is ridiculous, and even but they're not quite automatically successful. So in that sense, I think saving throws and ability checks. Um, are fine without crits and, and fumbles. But in terms of like the decision to even ask for a roll, th that plays more in like, when I think about failure, I think about things that are more like automatic failure. Like, no, the king's never gonna believe that lie. That's just pre preposterous, you know? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, you, I don't care what you roll on your check, you're not jumping across this chasm. It's, it's a chasm, you know, it's big. <laughs> you're gonna just fall right down the middle of it. To me, that's only come through uh, you know, experience and just playing D and D like this since um, I don't know forever, and so mm -hmm. just have internalized a lot of the DCs and how long things should take. Um, but if you're new to this, you'd look at the rule books and there's a lot of holes. So th that's just the first step, right? Like we're still deciding what the DC and whether to call a roll. Exactly. Um, and there is a small chart about DCs. There are, yes. In the, in the, in the player's handbook. Just as a, you know, it, when, when the DM calls for a check, you know, at what level uh, should you uh, set it and what is that, that difficulty? You know, like five is very easy, mm -hmm. moves on up to medium at 15, hard at 20, nearly impossible at 30. Yeah. Now, with some of these builds, mm -hmm. players can hit some of those higher numbers pretty quickly. Is that a bug yeah. or a feature? I, it's, I, I, I go both ways on this sometimes, and, I, and mm -hmm. I think ultimately I fall on the, it's a feature so long as it's kept limited, yeah. but that sort of level of, of specialization in a particular skill proficiency, it has one of those things where it's like, all right, is it really just a rogue and a bard thing, or do, like, like for instance, there's a lot of things that mimic it for rangers, even players handbook rangers. Uh, there's, of course, the prodigy feat, uh, which lets you get expertise, mm -hmm. so it, it's not exclusive to the classes, but it does blow yeah. those DCs out of the water. <laughs> oh, it does, especially when you when, when multiple characters focus on a skill and you have a cleric and, a, and a, say, a bard in the party, oh, sure. and they both give the rogue bless and bardic inspiration yeah. on top of the rogue's expertise and everything else. And that's when you can really and, just... You, and you can have rogues, trace. <laughs> yeah, pass that trace. You can have rogues, like, hiding in plain sight under a spotlight or... You know, see, that's just clouds. plain. That's just plain impossible, though. That's the kind of thing. Like you can have all that, but at a certain point, you're just stacking the deck. You don't really need it anymore. And I think mm -hmm. this is where choosing what your DC is. It, it's worth it to keep in mind. Like what is and isn't even possible with this. So like you know, and hiding in the, the shadow of a spotlight kind of thing. It's like that's a decision you make. Like that's cool as shit, right? Like there are there's a game of D and D where that's awesome and appropriate, but not for like every game of D and D. 
And so there's ways to do it in 5th edition. It's like I can hide even under observation. I treat anything as light obscurement or heavy obscurement, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, ways that you can do that. But it's a feature that these DCs are the way they are. The fact that rogues and bards and and people that hyper-specialize in a particular skill are able to break them is part of what makes D&D so fun. That Mm -hmm. perception and stealth are so central to the gameplay of D&D and the other skills become sort of increasingly less so. That's how you structure your adventures and reward players for thinking about their environment. Like, it's as much on the the group as it is on the rules to address. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't need a DC. Sometimes you don't. Uh, So let's let's talk about contests here, Jim. Yep. So when you have uh, certain ability checks, uh, I, I mean, obviously, probably one of the most obvious ones is the grapple check. Sure, yeah. Opposed athletics or acrobatics on the uh, uh, defender's part. Um, I, you don't I, like that? I, I, I listen. The dexterity already gets a lot of love, and I am yeah. perfectly fine with ogreish brutes being able to lock down scrappy little nimble, uh, you know, the likes. That, to me, they can squirm all they want, but mm-hmm. you still got a hold of them. You know, I, I don't, it's one of those things where it, ath- acrobatics and athletics are two separate things for a reason. Because they mm-hmm. cover two very different areas of physical expertise. Uh, this not is to true. mix up game terms or anything. Uh, and so, like, letting them get subbed for in and out. Like, and it's because to me, I've seen instances of, like, can I roll acrobatics instead of athletics for jumping? Can I do it for, you know, doing parkour? Um, which I think it's like, a, it's a part of it. Why isn't your character good at athletics and acrobatics? Right? Like, if you want to run mm-hmm. around, come on. Anyway, I, that's my. That's my that's my jag on athletics. It's fine. Oh, actually, I, I miss tumble. I miss everybody tumbling around a battlefield to avoid attacks of opportunity, like they're oh, shooting the like they're thing. shooting rolls in a, in a video shooting game. rolls between people's legs and stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, no, no. That's that that was the old ways. Uh, you can still do that technically with ac- with acrobatics. Sure. You could. I would argue it anyway. Yeah, um, there's some Pruitt's game. See, you're embracing yeah. the spirit of it already. Yeah. No, uh, no, I, 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 that was one of my favorite tactics when I played my rogues or monks back in oh the day. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I don't want to get into a verbal grapple with you over sure. acrobatics versus athletics. But I mean, that's all right. In my grappling days, when I when I would grapple uh, back in the Taekwondo days where I'm sitting yeah. there at 150 pounds uh-huh. and I'm grappling a guy who's 275, he's not that dexterous. And he's just trying to like hold me in place as I'm just slipping my arms in and out sure. and getting, because acrobatics and grappling I see is working more about uh, getting the perfect arm bar as sure, opposed sure. to holding and and holding someone in place like say with a choke hold or yeah, whatever, yeah. but actually being able to slip out and and get a wrist lock or a pinky lock and flip someone around. That's how you use your acrobatics. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't oh, have I necessarily, but that but see that's the thing though is now I'm arguing to be able to use acrobatics to initiate a grapple. That, so that's, that's a whole the other, thing, other right? thing. How do they correspond? And even how should it correspond to reality, right? Like yeah. clearly grappling involves all kinds of physical strength and acumen oh, yeah. and all that. It's not just any one sort of thing. And like, but like, I don't know any athletes who aren't some combination of dexterous, strong and, and with endurance and, and they, because mm-hmm. they, it's the physical body is a whole thing. The same with perception and, and the like. So to me, I come at it entirely from a game perspective like a balance between the stats and the skills. Like it does it to me, it's like we're past trying to reflect reality at that point. Unless, unless, yeah. unless you're like a monk or something, I could see it for monks. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the guy oh, you were totally. grappling just wasn't proficient in grappling. Well, he, he was, he, well, anyway, <laughs> to return to contests, this is like the second, the supplement to the building block. If the building block is ability check versus DC, then the sort of the supplement of that is ability check versus ability check. And like, you can really do anything you want in the game with those two things. You can run yeah. any kind of game you want with those and the uh, 10, 15, 20 ability scores. And like, you can just like pull that out, like the beating heart <laughs> and, and use that to craft a game around because it really is uh, what, what keeps the game going. And, and like, to me, I see attack rolls and saving throws as specialized ability checks. Like, yeah. you know, re- once you've understood and, and sort of like grasped how those two things work, anything else you want to do, you can just build up from those and the PHB and DMG give us some some starters for that um, mm-hmm. but then uh, let us take it uh, the rest of the way looking through the rest of say the player's handbook we have uh, an introduction to what introduction to what exactly skills are we kind of talked about that a minute ago about uh, 
them being areas of specialization and focus. We have the <laughs> variant rule of uh, alternate ability scores with um, skill proficiencies, which we're going to have to spend an entire show on. <laughs> like, there's just no way to cover it all and keep mm -hmm. the episodes uh, manageable. So uh, we will cover that one in a future show. Needless to say, I think it's awesome, and it makes the game uh it makes the game richer. So, oh, it, uh, it will... really it, it, it really will let your players like think outside the box as far as just like how to come at a problem and and figure it out within their skill set, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And ability set, technically, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> it, there's some vagueness in terms of like criteria for when it is, it isn't appropriate or whatever. Um, but I think that's just a, the way that the player's handbook and DMG are written. There's a lot of sometimes or in some cases or oftens um, as opposed to giving you like hard and fast criteria. And so looking at that, we've already talked about passive checks, um, but we probably will return to it in the future uh, in other episodes. And then working together is, uh, is where it sort of rounds itself out before getting into the individual abilities. Really everything you need is right there. And the thing that I like about working together is it clearly says like, listen, if, if the player isn't proficient in this, they can't help someone else. And like, it still needs to be useful for you to try to to be you know to receive help in the first place there's just some things you can't do for yourself it also covers of course group checks which um i really like and i like how they were developed in ghost of salt marsh and i, I want to see more of that from the rules but it's also one of those that i think you can fiddle with uh the group check and sort of like whose whose role should we really pay attention to here because i'm kind of i'm increasingly of the opinion that like the ranger, yeah, we really don't need to worry about them in the wild. It's the wizard we've got to worry about. Like, the yeah. wizard doesn't leave their tower. <laughs> they, they don't have. They didn't pick this proficiency. But they don't know mm -hmm. anything of what they're doing. It, it matters what they roll, because what they roll is going to be the source of conflict, obstacles, something to actually have a game moment around, rather than, yeah. oh yeah, you didn't fail another roll to walk around the wilderness, because of the class you picked, which is like you're supposed to be good at that. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go, though, I'm curious as to your thoughts on not like each individual ability, but just sort of the highlights that you have uh, for like strength, dex, con. We'll definitely talk about uh, why there's not more con saves or skills, <laughs> but whatever. That's sure. fine. Uh, I still think that there should be more more strength uh, uh, yeah. skills. But again, they condensed it down. Um, yeah. But I, I do agree with you on that on that regard as far as athletics goes because i think that the difference between like climbing and running and swimming are are different yeah they're like different muscle groups i'm thinking about this realistically yeah. they're different muscle groups and so it's just <laughs> like you're going to be better at one or the other you know depending on what you train sure or what you do and so like an overall check for all of them it's kind of like you know i mean it's easier i get it it's easier that's what it is. Um, but put, at your table, you could break those up if you want. Easily, easily. Um, yeah. I would probably give more skill points. But anyway, sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. There's no skill wanna... points in fifth edition. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, it's, it's not I just know. you. It's not just you. I know. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I can definitely see that. And if you're going for, like, a, a more martial-focused game where mm -hmm. it, there's, you know, just less magic, everybody wants to do the brawn type thing, Breaking them up is probably a good idea because it will differentiate those characters from each other further. I think of the same, we, we were just sort of talking about the difference between acrobatics uh, and athletics, but it was interesting to like actually read like, all right, first off, it's been a while since I've read this, but like actually see what acrobatics is meant for. And to me, when I'm reading through this list of using each ability score and sort of how the skill proficiencies interact with that ability score, what their specializations of, and then what isn't covered by a proficiency uh, uh, skill, skill proficiency, mm -hmm. is like, these are all moments of a game that are waiting to be played. And so one of the questions that we got was just sort of like how to build adventures around skills and skill use, how to highlight skills, you know, that players have taken that aren't, you know, that aren't like the big survival, perception, stealth, uh, arcana, and athletics. I think those are the yeah. big, I'd say those are the big five in my experience, um, insight, uh, is to read through this section and sort of see how could you set a situation up where this kind of skill use uh, would be useful or this sort of ability check would be useful. So mm -hmm. constitution ability checks to me are like survival. 
how far can you go? How far can you push yourself? Um, and to me, I, I would insert constitution checks into the, you know, how much food and water you need, how much sleep you need. And to me, it would be different than a constitution saving throw because it's not something inflicted on the character. It's something that they have chosen to do. And that's right. the big difference between save and, and check, uh, in, in my opinion. And so it's like, if you, yeah, I'm setting out to do this. I'm setting out to make this travel or this trek or this endurance. Maybe it's to prove something or, or qualify for some benefit or something. That endurance, it doesn't have to take a lot of time in game, like at the table. You could easily handle it with a series of uh, uh, ability checks that uh, we're going to have to talk about in the future. Mm -hmm. So we've got at least five in this series. I hope it doesn't get too yeah. long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you definitely want to another way to kind of draw out an athletics check or excuse me, uh, acrobatics check is, uh, you know, never forget Die Hard. It's not like oh, yeah. putting a bunch of glass on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Making yeah, people yeah. have to move through it. Some people might call that difficult terrain. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, difficult, ter it's check. difficult terrain where every five feet of it you take damage. You know, it's, then yeah. it's a constitution check just to see if you can force yourself to move. You know or I mean? you make an acrobatics <laughs> check to move full speed. Or make an acrobatics check to move full speed. Yeah, I hope you don't slice something you don't want but to. But if you fail, <laughs> yeah, you're going to take damage. So you just adding damage. like a, adding, yeah. not it's not a trap and it's not like an environmental hazard, but it's something in between. Yeah. Something like that. Um, or just remember to put those tight ropes and chandeliers in the game. Yes. To, uh, to give so people the multi levels. chance. Multi-levels yeah. do a lot to improve your combats anyway. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> moving on from the, the three physical, though, the, the big ones that I see in intelligence are mm -hmm. uh, a lack of corresponding lore for the monster types because that's a no-brainer. And for me, I, I see there being multiple monster types associated with each of the lore, typical lore skills, with Arcana being the most... Um, at like, I don't know, where did I put it? I don't have it with me. That's fine. We'll talk about it in a future one because we are going to talk about how to expand skills, how to modify them, bring in new ones. The other two for intelligence that I, uh, that I was thinking about were mathematics and mercantile. And like, those would be two skills that you can do a lot with. Mathematics mm -hmm. would be something that, you know, applies to say spell research in a classic Vancean sense. Uh, it could apply to all different kinds of engineering type uh, tasks that players might want to undertake, especially combined with tool use. And there's just something, I don't know, interesting to me about playing a character that's fluent in mathematics. Doesn't usually see a lot of play in fantasy RPGs, but I think you could do something fun with. Uh, and then mm -hmm. mercantilism is just appraising goods, uh, you know, conducting deals, that kind of thing. Uh, trade is usually one of those uh, downtime activities that uh, some players seem to enjoy. So having a skill associated with it is, uh, is would be interesting. Like I'm trying to think of that, especially if you had a game that like was in long, like really long term, like mm -hmm. you, you just knew that you guys were gonna play for, you know, have months of downtime, you know, for some of this to, uh, to go through. Oh yeah. yeah. So you're gonna need to do something with that gold. You're gonna need to invest in it, start <laughs> businesses, funding other parties. Yeah. How you, then you're going to need somebody to, to, to do your books for you. Absolutely. Or, like you said, you take mathematics yourself, you balance your own books, become an accountant, then uh, yeah. you retire from adventuring. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you discover new spells. You accidentally set off a kind of apocalyptic doomsday situation with, like, the wrong equation. Uh, lots of... You, you cast golden spiral wrong. You, yeah, you just do the whole thing wrong. And unmake reality. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oops. You find that one snag. Um <laughs> the, but <laughs> uh, I'm gonna try to keep it together. Um, in terms of wisdom and charisma, the big thing that jumps out to me is a passage in Insight that says whether or not you get to predict what you, what someone's next move will be. And I just am like, all right, how did we let this one slip by us? How in the world did this? I, you mean I could have been rolling insight as a fighter this entire time to try to figure out what's going on? I could have been forcing my dungeon masters to have to lock mm -hmm. in a particular course of action, <laughs> you know, just to uh, uh, just to mess with them. I really love this, and I really want to use more insight into um, into like predicting a fight or or predicting someone's moves in a fight. I don't know. Maybe insight could even be replace initiative or something. Um, anyway, that's that's where my wild thoughts are at the moment on that. Um, oh no, I, I I like the idea of a of someone who's not maybe that dexterous. Yeah. But but they just know how battle flows. 
Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then finally, charisma. I, I found the uh, answer to a question that I've had for a while, which is what's the difference between performance and a musical instrument? And, uh, you know, it's pretty clear after reading it that performance is to entertain through a variety of different means, but it's, it's about delivering an entertaining performance. And the musical instrument proficiency is about, uh, you know, being technically proficient with an instrument. Uh, and it sounds like all those bardic songs out there need to be skill challenges uh, as opposed to anything else, but um, <laughs> right? <laughs> make, them, make them work for it, you know? No, I get that. I three, get that. three successes before three failures. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's not a lot to go on in terms of the player's handbook and Dungeon Master's Guide for like how to just use skills and get the most out of them. There's a lot of situations that they seem vague or, or like the rules are being a little nitpicky or something. The longer I spend with 5th edition, the more I see these as features and that if anything the rule books needed to do was to explain that this was the case entirely. Because they don't really tell you, hey, we haven't provided these things here. We haven't told you how long skills take. We, we haven't given you strict criteria for when uh, a player can retry a failed attempt or who can retry afterwards. They've just let you know that those are the possibilities and that there's a variety of options you can, uh, you know, that you can use, all these different ways to take it in between these extremes. The, I see the rules really as inviting us as dungeon masters and even as players to suggest ways to deepen the rules, to add complexity to them. And I think this long into the game, a lot of people have picked up on that. Um, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's for the players and DMs out there who are still seeming to like struggle with ability checks or struggle to come to the same page in, on expectations of, you know, the DM often expects one thing and the player expects another. And I think like returning to what the rule books have to say, however incomplete it is, is still worthwhile because the fundamentals are there. Like, player, you just describe what you're doing. You don't even need to look at your character sheet. You know, you don't even have to look at that. Role play as if you're there and not looking at a, at a game menu of options. And through the course of that role playing and description and interaction with the world, the, occasionally the dungeon master will go, oh, that sounds like a stealth check. Or to be more accurate, a, an ability check of, you know, dexterity ability check with the stealth proficiency. Um, although I think stealth check is just fine for most tables. <laughs> yeah, no, you it's, know. Uh, it's, 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 it's just fine. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into some of the more uh, deeper corners of the topic because uh, there's a lot of fun stuff about skills that, uh, mm -hmm. that we've, we have yet to even begin to talk about. I know, and it's not just stealth, but they, they can sneak up on you. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. And check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Jim, on your end, is it fine? Jim is one of the aliens coming out of the spaceship at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind one before they resolve into focus. One of y'all watch the wrong video. One of y'all motherfuckers watch the wrong video. Can you just tell me to put fifty thousand dollars in unmarked bills uh, in a bag and leave it by? <laughs>